and you can see that red, a raspberry crown borer has really devastated the vigor of these plants and the productivity. At this point, when we were doing some insecticide efficacy studies, uh, we had greater than five raspberry crown borer larvae per plant, and this is what the plants looked like. Biology and identification. This is a clear wing moth. It's native to areas from New England to Georgia and west to Nebraska and south to Louisiana. It's been reported at damaging plants in British Columbia and California and even in New Mexico. Identification, you can see the adults have these yellow bands, makes them look like a yellow jacket. And the, the young, the larvae, are in the, in the cane or in the crown, and they're just a typical white cecid or clear wing moth. Hosts, typically in, Ar in Arkansas, we see them mostly a damaging blackberry, but they are reported to get on dewberry and raspberry further north. Symptoms, tunneling in the crown. Sometime in May and June, you start seeing them tunneling into the lower part of the cane. And here you can actually see inside there, inside that tunnel, the head of the larva. Canes are girdled at the base and they wilt, as you can see to the right here. It kind of a, looks like a shepherd's crook. And they're dead all the way to the soil line. And this type of thing happens in June, July, and August. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, yields do drop considerably and the plants will eventually die if they get enough larval damage. Biology. Eggs are laid on the underside of the leaf. The larva walks down the cane to just below the soil line and then tunnels into the side of the cane where it overwinters. This is a photo from Washington State. Then in the spring, starting in early April in our area and probably more likely May further north, uh, the larva tunnels in the, in the crowns. And you can see in the south, we have an 11-month life cycle, or well, it finishes in one full year. And in the north, it actually takes a full two years as a larva, 22 months. Sometime in the fall, I think in the further north, you start seeing these pupil skins uh, coming out in late August, early September. In our area, it comes out more like in mid-September, and you can find adults throughout most of September or October. And here's a, a, both a male and a female. There's a mating pair. And during the day, you can find females in this posture where you can actually see them curling their abdomen under the leaf and laying an egg. Scouting, there's two ways of scouting. In July, you, if you're just looking for damage, you can actually look for the dying canes. And in trellis plantings, a lot of times the canes don't get to move very much with the wind and they don't break off at the bottom. So you don't see the dying cane. Uh, but later in the season, you can also cut and look for the larva in the hole in the tunnel. In September or late August, you can look for females laying eggs, or you can actually look for eggs. Now, in terms of control, we have been working on some biological control, and we've also been testing various in other insecticides. Cultural control, if the population isn't too high, you can actually find which plants are infested in, in July before they pupate and remove the plant. <coughs> we 
have been ha having slight success using biological control. And this is something that we find that sometime at bud break in spring, um, we can irrigate and soil drench the plants with some nematodes. But the best we've done so far is about 53% reduction in larval count. This was research done by my student, Jackie McKern. We have done both releases of nematodes, S. feltii, H. bacteriophora, and S. carpocapsi. You can see the rate and the dates. Late October, this is after egg hatch. May, this is really about the time when the larvae in our area have started moving up into the, the cane. Again, we tried a second year in November with applications, and then the following year we did it right at bud swell, uh, trying to make sure we got the larvae. Here you can see the results of correct timed applications. We can get anywhere from 80 to 100 percent control. Brigade or uh, Guthion is now canceled. It used to be our standard compound as a soil drench. But Brigade, which is by Fenthrin, works real well. And that's the only thing registered right now. Some of our growers did not like the label that says use, a, use 200 gallons per acre of this material. So we tried 50, 100, and 200 gallon rates as a soil drench. And you can see we had similar, fairly similar control with all rates from 50 to 200 gallons. But right now the label says 200. You can see in A, when the larvae have already tunneled into the crown, they're pretty much unexposed to pesticide, and they also, it's very difficult for nematodes. See, we, we had very few nematodes controlling the larvae at that time, compared to an earlier application, just when they're starting to feed on the, on the canes. So we do have some success with biocontrol, but not a whole lot. Now applying your soil drench, whether it be nematodes or uh, insecticide, you have to keep a weed-free strip so the material gets down to the crown. Weeds cause poor coverage. Here you can see our tractor driver uh, trying to apply this material to the base of the plants, but he has to go through all that grass. And in this case, he's applying that egg hatch, which is in October in our area, or even as late as early November. And you can actually delay until bud break in the spring, which is April in our area, which may be May in yours. And like I said, brigade is the only thing registered. Okay, um, I've moved my speaker a little bit away from my mouth. Is that any better? I, I think it's good, Don. I think... Um, okay. Yeah, I, th I think it's okay. Green June beetle, uh, you can see you can see this map in the green are all the locations where they've been reported feeding on ripening fruit. So if you're outside that area, you can ignore the next few minutes, but it's an interesting insect. Identification, the adults have these almost fluorescent green wings. They're from one to one and a half inches long. The larva is a grub. It's C-shaped and it has a vertical roster. And you can see that right here. These hairs are in a two rows vertically. These are the hosts. They attack ripening fruit. You can see grapes, apples, and you can get them on blackberries. Typically, most of our blackberries are almost finishing 
uh, by the time the adults come out. Here you can see the adults coming out in mostly in July and August. There's a larva. It's easy to recognize. It's usually nocturnal, but it ambles along on its back in the grassy areas. Pupates in the soil in a soil cell. You get some adults coming out in late June, early July. They lay eggs. They get hungry. Go feed on fruit, anything ripe. The larvae feed on decomposed organic matter. So if you have a pasture with organic matter, uh, manure, that's where they'll be. We do have a rearing method for our various studies. We just use soil with a, some alfalfa meal as a nutrient source. In May, we can actually sift the soil. We get the pupil cells, get some of the larvae. There's a soil cell right there. And we can sex the beetles, the adults. It looks like two cat's eyes on the female and this more horizontal structure on the, f on the male in terms of their abdomen tip. We've been developing a trap for mass trapping green gene beetles. And you can see the, the box on the upper left. We, have, we catch thousands of these beetles, so we had to increase the trap capture size. We have a green June beetle lure that's actually available, like from Great Lakes IPM, which we developed. And also, uh, we use 91% isopropanol. And you can see that both of those uh, give fairly similar counts, 10,000, 14,000. This is a weak count. In one week's time, we catch that many. Green June beetle control. Uh, there's a number of compounds registered for green gene beetles, but most of them have more than a three-day pre-harvest interval. And what you're trying to do is get them off ripening fruit. So it's, it's kind of a tricky deal to find the right compound. Mass trapping so far has not been effective after our first year, but we think that using several traps around a planting we may, after several years, be able to mass trap the population out of the area. So they'll be below damaging levels. Now, I know Japanese beetle is in your area. You can see this is the distribution map, anything in purple. So basically, anything from Iowa, Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, Arkansas, and Georgia north to all the way into Vermont and, and Maine. Just for your information, I'm located in this hot spot right here, in northwest Arkansas. Japanese beetle ID, fairly easy to identify. It's about half the size of a green gene beetle, has brown wings, has these six white spots on the side of the abdomen with this nice couple of tufts on the tip. C-shaped larva and a V raster. That's this kind of V-shaped hairs right here. Japanese beetle is an introduced pest from Japan. 300 species of plants that it feeds on, and mostly it's a defoliator. But you can see on the crepe or crab apple in the middle, it will feed on fruit, and it does get on blackberries. But we see more damage on the leaves and, uh, and the flowers. Recently, Maxi and Pfeiffer produced this nice graph showing the number of Japanese beetles per two meters a row relative to several varieties of raspberry. And you can see that the first four are very low in terms of Japanese beetle counts. But then you get uh, Autumn Bliss, Fall Gold, and Prelude seem to be a little bit more susceptible. Japanese beetles differ in defoliation of those same raspberry varieties. Here you can see percent defoliation. 
And again, Fall Gold, Autumn Bliss, and Prelude seem to have the most foliar damage, but even 5% doesn't seem to be a whole lot. But in our area, it, it tends to be more of the leaves around the flowers. So that could be damaging. Scouting and control. Japanese beetles come out in June in our area, uh, July up in Michigan. And you can see they like to feed on things on the top part of plants. This is, a, this is grapes. They just skeletonize the top part of the plant. And our growers, ever since they've been here since about 2002, we've been having to apply weekly insecticides to prevent that defoliation. This year we tried using surround kale and clay on the plants, and you can see the difference in defoliation. We drastically reduced the defoliation with the surround, but ever, after every rainfall we've had to reapply it to maintain that whitewashed look. So that does seem to be a, a good alternative to several weekly sprays of insecticide. Okay, our last, the last insect I'll, or organism I'll talk about is a broad mite. This is a new pest in our area. It's usually a problem in greenhouse plants in temperate and subtropical regions. As you can see, it gets on pepper and impatience and causes leaf deformation. But in 2007, we actually found this on primocane berry and blackberry, prime arc 46. And I'll address the Japanese beetle traps here in a second. I saw that come up. <coughs> um, on the far right, you can see primocane blackberry being damaged. Here's the broad mite distribution with all the little black dots. These are the two new locations in Arkansas and North Carolina. We found them in both locations. I don't know what it is about Primark 46, but it seems to, the broad mite seems to like that cultivar. What does it look like? You can see it's about a tenth of a millimeter in size. They're not very big. The males are yellow, have longer legs. The female is more white, and it kind of, you can almost see the egg inside the female. And then the egg is clear with those 30, 29 to 37 white tufts. Very characteristic. What does it do? ACE pictures are infested plants compared to the healthy plants, BDF. You can see it greatly reduces uh, cluster size and leaf size and it curls, curls the leaves. Management, uh, we're just starting to learn how to manage these, but we did use some predatory mites. We, we purchased and released uh, predatory mites and Javichich has also indicated that he used Neocelis californicus and got fairly good control um, on pepper. Our miticides, of course, that are labeled, that you can find broad mite on the label, and some of the insecticidal soaps and, and oils. These are many of the publications that I mentioned during the presentation. And just to not acknowledge some of our funding sources in organic or integrated organic program, IR4 minor use program. Uh, we also have some funding from our uh, small fruit consortium. At this point, I'll try to answer any questions. I guess I can go back and answer that question about Japanese beetle traps. Yeah, we've used Japanese beetle traps around. Uh, a grape vineyard, we had like 17 traps. We could only trap on one side because there was cows that were eating our traps on the other sides. And we trapped over a million Japanese beetles and there was still, the grower still applied three sprays in his vineyard and was still losing foliage. So in a very high population 
Japanese beetle traps will not mass trap and remove enough to prevent having to use insecticide. Um, do we have any other comments or questions for Dr. Johnson? Uh, I think people are typing and maybe, oops, um, there's another one. The, would the same cultural controls for crown borer work with cane borer? Yeah, I think uh, Hannah will probably mention that. Uh, she'll be talking about redneck cane borer. And one of the controls is if you have about less than 5 to 10 percent of your canes galled, you can remove those during the pruning period. But if it gets abo above 10 percent, you're starting to cut into your yield by quite a bit. Uh, so that's kind of where we do a cutoff. And then there's a question from Marvin Pritz about the photo um, showing the big differences in crown borer damage and whether that was the age of the planting or the cultivar that provided that difference. Well, the, the cultivar in the back on that second, very second slide was very new. That was about two years old. Go back to that. And then the cultivar in the front, yeah, I think it was slide two. I don't know where it's at, really. It's slide four. Um, yeah, that one. These are two-year-olds. These are about seven or eight-year-old Navajo. These are, I think it was Apache or Arapaho. And then Jeff Miller had a question about the mode of action of the clay application, and that's just a surface kind of thing, right? Yeah, it, it basically makes the the leaves white, and it also creates a kind of a dust on the on the plant. So I think one, the Japanese beetles don't see the plant as a, a yellow plant; they see it as a white structure. So it's kind of camouflaged. And two, I think it really, they spend more time cleaning their mouth parts and their legs when they're on those leaves. So it, it's kind of a disturbing, uh, dirty appearance on their food. It's, it'd be kind of like us putting sand in our, in our food and trying to eat that. It's not very appetizing. I don't think it kills any. And then there's a question about the application, and I think around us we just spray it on. Is that <coughs> how you... Yeah, it's all sprayed on, and it's one of those things you have to be patient with because it kind of goes on slow. You spray it once. I had a commercial grower use his air blast sprayer. He, he went down the road once and looked at it, and he said, well, it's still not quite white enough. So he went again, and it took about two or three trips to get, get it to a, accumulate to a kind of a whitewashed appearance. It's a challenge to keep it agitated, too. I know that's a, an issue. Yeah, you have, to have an, you have to have an agitator uh, system in your tank. Or if you're doing it by backpack, you do a lot of dancing. A lot of dancing. I, I just wanted to comment to those people who <coughs> think that the June beetle might not be an issue for New York and New England, but certainly in the Hudson Valley we've seen these insects. Um, and I think that probably in the lower southern tier they may have seen them. Uh, and perhaps certain areas of um, New England as well. So that it's we're not completely out of the woods with that one. And I just wanted to ask a question quickly before we move on. But um, the broad mite that you're talking about is it the ex is it the same broad mite that's a greenhouse pest? Is that what you said earlier? Okay. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Does anyone else have any questions or comments for Dr. Johnson? He will be here through the next presentation, so perhaps at the end. And I think we'll... Okay, great. Thank you. Yes. Let's move on to our second speaker. Um, just find things here. I'll turn mine off. This is... Um, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hannah Barak. Um, she is from North Carolina State University and is the uh, an assistant professor and extension specialist there. She actually has um, some responsibilities with small fruits as well as tobacco, uh, working to enhance pest management in both of these crops. She's interested in landscape scale management issues, host preference behavior of insects, and invasive species biology. So uh, I'm very happy to have uh, Dr. Barak join us to talk about uh, more caneberry insect management.
Uh, are you able to turn on your Sorry, oh, <laughs> I'm so Can you hear me all right now? I have the little mic icon. Can you? Okay, excellent, excellent. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I have um, just one quick comment about Japanese beetle traps and surround. First of all, Don, I'm incredibly impressed that you apply surround with a backpack. Um, my experience with that has always been the rates of the material you have to use make it a pretty heavy duty <laughs> amount of, of clay that's going on there. And um, I actually worked on it uh, in olives in California, and to get good coverage on tree crops is particularly challenging. You need a lot of water and a lot of uh, clay, so it's a pretty heavy-duty process. And then uh, just to comment briefly on Japanese beetle traps, we actually discourage growers from using them in North Carolina because the lures are incredibly attractive. They'll draw beetles in from a great distance, but um, they don't actually, as Don said, trap them out of the area. They've been shown to pull beetles in from as far away as up to a mile. So basically, you're putting out a little signal that you've got something interesting and they should come check out and along the way they might find your planting in addition to the trap itself. So we, we don't recommend the use, for the, uh, the use of them by growers because typically they tend to either not help with the problem or potentially make it worse. And I'm going to focus on another set of caneberry pests, particularly some beetles, mites, talk a little about thrips work that we're doing, and I'll talk briefly about some potential pests. Laura mentioned that I have an interest in invasive species biology, so that'll come out a little bit at the end of this talk as well. But first, I want to acknowledge some folks who've done a b the bulk of the caneberry work before I arrived in the southeast. You've heard from Don this afternoon and Don presented some work that's been done by Doug Pfeiffer and his graduate student Laura Maxey. I'll also have some information of theirs in this talk as well and I also want to highlight one of my horticulture counterparts down here at NC State, Gina Fernandez. She is the caneberry horticulturalist as well as a breeder. Um, looking particularly at developing some heat tolerant raspberries because those of y'all north of us get to grow all sorts of great raspberries but we're stuck uh, in the southeast with the, the inability to grow raspberries in the warmer parts of the state here. I also wanted to highlight a couple internet resources. Um, Laura mentioned my blog and feel free to check that out. I post about two to three times a week and I try to keep that fairly up to date. If there's any comments that you have on that, feel free to post them there or get in touch with me if there's something you'd like to learn more about. And then my personal website is here. We're in the process of, de of developing integrated pest management web pages as a part of this website. So that's in process as well. I want to talk a little bit about um, my philosophy of integrated pest management before we jump in here, um, primarily because I'll be talking about IPM in the context of this presentation and I want to make sure we're all on the same page first. So when I think of IPM, I think of the three M's and for me that's minimize, monitor, and manage. And practically what that means is we minimize the likelihood of having a pest problem in our planting by reducing the things or changing the things we can to result in a le the least hospitable environment for pests as possible. Secondly, we monitor our pest populations, which means we track both on an individual point in time and through time to see what our pest populations are doing. Also under here are some things that Don touched on really well. Specifically, we need to know what insects we have. So those ID techniques are really important and that falls under monitoring. And finally, manage. And this is the thing we tend to think about first when it comes to integrated pest management, but really it's a logical outflow of these first two minimizing and monitoring. Then we decide whether or not we have a pest problem that requires management. So the ways we manage pests are threefold. And again, I have these listed kind of in terms of hierarchy. First off, we start off with cultural control. Those are the things we do in that minimize category. We select the right variety. We fertilize in the way that's appropriate for pest management. We um, prune in ways that reduce our pest population. I'll talk about how some of those tools apply to specific caneberry pests as we get further in here. 
Biocontrol is the second tier I like to exploit. So first, we do everything culturally we can to make the least hospitable place for pests. Secondly, we move in and see if there's cultural control techniques that are appro or sorry, biological control techniques that are appropriate for the pests that we're trying to target. And again, these are things like using predators um, or, as Don mentioned, using nematodes. Those are different biological control organisms that we can utilize in the caneberry system. And then third, I like to consider chemical control after we've considered the first two. And I break down organic versus conventional because I think a lot of folks, particularly people who aren't producers, get organic kind of thrown all up in there. And really, organic producers still to a certain extent may use chemical controls. They're just OMRI acceptable chemical controls. So as long as we're talking about chemicals, let me first mention um, I'm not going to be talking about a lot of pesticides in this talk, and that's primarily because all of you all are from different parts of the country. So both pest status and biology are going to differ based on where we are. Where there are differences between people in the Northeast and the Southeast, I'll point out because I think that's where most of our folks are from. And in general, the insect pests covered in this talk are east of the Mississippi. So I'll point out any critters that might differ along those lines, but there's, a, as Don showed in some of the maps that he illustrated with, most of the organisms that we're going to talk about are caneberry pests east of the Mississippi. So biological and cultural control methods can generally be generalized over lots of different places, using predatory mites, using nematodes, pruning, those are things we can do pretty much anywhere. But the time at which we do those might change. So bear that in mind when I talk about those methods. Chemical control options, specifically pesticides, are not generalizable. Registrations for materials differ between states. So I may slip and mention some specific pesticides at points in this talk, but contact your local cooperative extension folks for local recommendations about which materials are registered and recommended for the pests in your area because the label is the law. That's the most important thing to follow whenever you're using a pesticide. If it's not labeled for the use that you're using it for, you cannot be using it. So this is a, a timeline for the southeast for some of the caneberry pests that Don mentioned and that I'll be mentioning. Um, I have the months down here along the bottom, but I also broke out the plant phenological timings along with that. So for those of you who are not in the southeast, refer to the bloom, fruit development, and harvest timings as for when these organisms are going to be showing up. I'll be talking a little bit about clippers. Let me hop ahead to the next slide here. I'll be talking a little bit about clippers, about cane borers, about stink bugs, thrips, and two-spotted spider mites. So let's jump right into those. So reality cost already had a question about cane borers. We've got two different cane borers in this system. The first one that I'm going to talk about is the raspberry cane borer. It's a lawn horn beetle. You can see where it gets its name from. It has these lawn antennae. And it's actually in the same genus as the, uh, the blueberry stem borer. So this is a genus that is an issue on other small fruits as well. So the adults for this particular insect appear in June, the eggs hatch in July, and the larvae overwinter in the canes. When the eggs are laid, there's a girdling that's about a half inch apart, about four to six inches below the growth point on a cane. This will result in some pretty distinctive tip wilting above these two girdle points. The larva is then going to move down the cane as it feeds toward the ground, and that entire cane will die. Most of the biology studies for this particular pest are from the north, and they suggest that there's a two-year life cycle. Don mentioned that there's a two-year life cycle for the raspberry crown borer in the north and a one-year life cycle for it in the south. We lack a lot of studies on this particular species in the south, so it may be a similar situation that we have a shorter life cycle here. I mentioned the larvae move down the cane as they develop. We'll talk about some cultural control methods for cane borers in general, but for raspberry cane borer, it's particularly important to prune below the damage. Keep going on down that cane 
until you no longer see tunneling in there when you're removing them. Because if you don't, you might not be removing the insect and it'll continue to develop. The other cane borer that we have, and these are some slides that Don uh, graciously provided for me to use as well, is the red-necked cane borer. And this is what we call a metallic wood boring beetle. They don't have those long antennae on them. And these are native to Canada, New England, out west to Minnesota, and south to the Gulf States. So again, an east of the Mississippi pest. This is what they look like. You can see their antennae are much shorter than the raspberry cane borer. So the adults feed and mate on the leaves and they lay their eggs only in the primocanes in the early summer. The larvae then girdle the cane. You can see a feeding cell for the larva right here with some frass in there. This girdling produce gall, produces galls in midsummer. The larvae overwinter in the pith of the cane. These galls actually will predispose these canes to greater degrees of winter injury because you'll see some photos in the next set of slides that actually show the canes are kind of bunched out so they become more susceptible to damage. There's some historic work all the way back in the 30s that actually listed some cultivars as perhaps having some resistance to redneck cane borer. Of course, these are cultivars that we're not really growing much anymore, so a, not a lot about our currently grown cultivars is known, but it appears that at least there's some resistance out there in the germplasm to this particular pest. There's really no known biological control for either of our cane boring beetles in, in this particular system. Our cultural control method is very similar to the, the cultural control method for raspberry crown borer. During the winter, as Don mentioned, if fewer than 5% of the canes are galled, prune off those galled canes and destroy them. It's very important that you don't just pile up those canes on the side of the planting and let them sit there because the insects will continue to develop in them and can emerge out as adults and reinfest the planting. So they need to be burned, chipped, removed off site. You can also cut off primocanes down to the soil surface and that reduces that galling pretty distinctively and Don has some photos from his trial that was done in Arkansas and this is I, I mentioned what that galling looks like and you can see how it distends the cane there and can result in some greater potential damage. So the logic for this trial was to avoid galls on primocanes after the egg lane was occurring in early spring and pruning was done at several different dates and this photo was taken about in the middle of this and you can see the three different plots that were pruned out there and the number of galls were then tracked. And the take home message there is that after that egg laying period was when the lowest degree of galls were observed. And you can, uh, we can talk with Don a little bit more about any additional questions you have about this particular trial. We're gl I'm glad that he's sticking around for the rest of the session. So, as we mentioned, cultural control if you have less than 5% injury. If there's greater than that degree of injury, and 5 to 10% is perhaps a rule of thumb that is a rule of thumb that we use a bit more in North Carolina. If there's greater injury, there's some also some pesticide options that are available that would be used during that egg laying time when the adults are out and about. The target insect for treatment is the adults. We're not targeting the larvae in this case because they are going to be feeding inside of the cane and difficult to get a contact with an insecticide. So spray where the adults are, the lower part of the canes, especially in the primocanes since that's where they're going to be laying their eggs. There are also, there's a, a label for systemic insecticides use pre-bloom. That type of treatment would be targeting the larvae in the cane and not the adults. Moving on to strawberry clipper. This is a weevil. It's in the same genus as the boll weevil. So those of you who might be more familiar with that, it's in the same group. The adult is a small weevil. This is the type of injury that's attributable to strawberry clippers. They do exactly what their name suggests. They clip right below the bud. What that is, is them laying an egg at that point, and the larvae will then feed on the tip of that bud. So 
the threshold um, or the number of buds to sample is sampling 100 clusters beginning after first bloom. These are thresholds that were developed in Arkansas. And then when damage is observed, begin insecticide treatments. But I want to caution all of you, be very, very careful with bloom insecticide treatments. And this is just a link to one of the North Carolina Ag Chem Manual sections on insecticides that have varying degrees of bee toxicity. So this is the sort of thing to keep an eye out for if you run into an issue where you expect to be treating during bloom for whatever type of insect. We try to avoid recommending bloom treatments unless they're absolutely necessary. And I'll be interested to see what people say in response to Laura's question down there in the chat as to whether or not anyone's seen damage in New York. Moving on to spider mites. Because we primarily grow blackberries in North Carolina, they're usually a secondary pest for us. We see them in the fall on primocane leaves. However, there are much more serious pests in raspberries, and I will show you, I'll show you some photos that illustrate that from the Pacific Northwest, and that's where the most work has been done on spider mites and caneberries. So these are images of two spotted spider mites, Tetranicus urtici is the, the scientific name. And this is an adult female. You can tell that it's a female by her rounded abdomen versus the male here who has a pointed abdomen. These are some eggs. They're perfectly spherical. They almost look like little perfectly round grains of sand. These can be pretty easily observed with a handheld hand lens, 10x or greater would be my recommendation. These are images from the UC IPM webpage. It's just www.uc or ipm.ucdavis.edu. And I'll type that down in the box. One of the challenging things with using the internet as your IPM tool is that there's going to be things that are different from region to region. And the IPM website at UC Davis is an excellent resource for images. I wouldn't necessarily use it as a source for pest management because as a west of the Mississippi source, it's going to have some very different recommendations than we would have. Spider mites diapause in the winter, which, and a diapausing spider mite looks like this. They're kind of salmon-y orange color, and these food spots will go away as they're diapausing because diapause means they're not eating and they're not reproducing. Spider mites can be flared by the use of broad-spectrum insecticides in cane berries. This is where we tend to see most of a problem in the southeast, is if people are using broad-spectrum insecticides, they can create a spider mite problem where there may not have been one before. There are very good mite-specific control options that should be used instead of broad-spectrum insecticides. There's no developed threshold or scouting program for mites and cane berries, but a suggested scouting plan for those of you that might be concerned about them would be to sample at least 10 leaflets per acre, count the number of mites present, and treat when there are visual leaf symptoms. And this is what I mentioned about raspberries being far more susceptible to spider mites than blackberries will. These are, this is an uninfested leaf. This is an infested leaf in raspberries. And I apologize for the picture quality here, but these are plants that have been essentially defoliated by spider mite feeding. And I mentioned that they're primarily, a, they're have been primarily worked upon in the Pacific Northwest. In addition to the two spotted spider mite, which is shown here, they also have two other spider mites that they've recorded from cane berries, the yellow spider mite and the McDonald spider mite. So those are also out there. They're going to differ a little bit in appearance, but their management and feeding behavior will be essentially the same. When we talk about those two of those three M's of IPM, minimizing and managing, the most important thing to do for spider mites is to select the right pesticide when mites are present, particularly in blackberries, because they don't appear to be as much of a concern from the defoliation standpoint as they are in raspberries. So select a material that's not going to flare spider mites. Minimizing road dust can also contribute to reducing spider mite populations. Because they hide out on the undersides of leaves, 
Dust can adhere to the webbing that they create, hence their name spider mites, and create these refugia that they can hide in. So dust can exacerbate problems. There are also native and introduced biocontrol methods that are available. This is just some of the commercially available predatory mites, Phytocelus persimilis, Nilocelus californicus, Galandromus occidentalis, in addition to many other predatory mites that are available. Some of these may already occur in regions, or they can be purchased and augmented. If they're already there, see if they're doing the job for you. And finally, use mite-specific tools to control them. So use miticides to treat populations rather than using broad-spectrum insecticides. Moving on to thrips. We've been looking at thrips in my lab in blackberries for two years now, and we're, going, we're getting ready to roll into a third year. And the reason why we're looking at them is because there's been grower concern about fruit injury and potential pollination impacts. They're also a potential contamination pest. This is a box of blackberries that I bought at the grocery store this summer, and I'm not going to say where they were from. As I was sitting driving in my car the way home, I noticed that thrips were crawling out of the box, so I had to make my significant other take a detour to the lab so I could take a picture of, uh, of the thrips that were coming out of these blackberries that I just purchased at the gro grocery store. So they are a potential contamination pest. Uh, the objectives of this research were to figure out, because we essentially knew nothing about the thrips that were here, um, the diversity and the seasonal biology of what was present, and if they were actually causing a problem. If so, what management strategies could we use? So what we found is that thrips are present in both flowers and foliage in much higher numbers in the, f in the flowers, however. And the plant samples peak during bloom. You can see in the dark orange line and the open square line here. Those are our larval thrips and our adult thrips in samples. Those samples peak off the plant in bloom. However, our trap captures continue to increase even though our plant samples decrease. So our trap captures, although pretty decent at tracking our plant samples early in the season, just keep going up because they continue to move around, but they're not present on the plants in the same way. The traps that we're using are these two commercially available traps. This is a yellow AM trap and a blue card trap. Both of these are available from Great Lakes IPM, and Laura gave you the link earlier in the chat. And these are some homemade traps that we use because they allow us to identify to species the thrips that we're catching on them. So they're the same color as the two other traps that we're using, but we use them because they're a little a nicer research tool. But commercially, these are the types of traps that would be out there. And I'll go back to that slide for a second, just to illustrate that numerically, we tend to catch more thrips in the blue traps, but the results between the two years have been a little conflicting. We got significantly more thrips in our blue traps in 2008, and in 2009, we didn't see significant differences except for one date between our blue traps and our yellow traps. The reason why we use different colors is because different species of thrips are attracted to different colors, so we wanted to make sure that we were catching what was out there. As I mentioned, our blossom samples have a much higher density. Our foliage samples have some thrips out there, but they have a much higher diversity, and that's just illustrated by these two figures, our blossom sample over here and our foliage sample over here. Lots of different species showing up here, really only one species here, which are eastern flower thrips. We've been looking at insecticide efficacy for, these, for this particular group of insects as well. And I'll just give you the Cliff Notes version of that. We can reduce thrips numbers with pesticides, but this reduction hasn't corresponded with an increase in fruit size, an increase in druplet number, or an increase in uh, better shaped fruit. And I'll show you some, some data on that. Um, fruit set was not assess assessed in these trials. But we did a small-scale caging trial in 2009 to see if we could force damage from these insects and blackberries. This was done in Kinston, North Carolina. We caged buds or flowers, either mature buds that were going to be flowers in a matter of a day or so, or open flowers, with different densities of thrips, with 0, 5, 10, and 20 thrips. And then we assessed fruit set size, shape, druplets, white druplets, because we folks were concerned that white druplets may also be related to this. 
There are some limitations to this trial that I'll be completely upfront about. We didn't look at survivorship of the thrips, so we didn't go back and make sure they made it through the week that they were caged on there. We used western flower thrips because that's what we had in the colony. And we also, there might have been some potential effects to caging, although I don't think so. However, at those densities, we saw no difference in the number of fruit that were set. So this is 90% fruit set in almost all of our cages. We saw no difference in fruit volume. Again, none of these are significantly different from each other. And we saw no difference in the number of druplets. So our take home message there is, we've been doing a lot of work with thrips, but we don't think based on this evidence and the fact that we see no correlation in our insecticide trials between reducing thrips and having increased fruit quality, that we actually have something that's causing damage to the fruit. So instead, we're shifting our focus to looking at them as potential virus vectors. The thrips that are in red boxes on these two pie charts are known vectors of viruses that can be found in blackberries. We're also, as part of a greater group that Don is involved in and that one of our attendees here, Danny um, Liddell, is also involved in, we're looking at other potential virus vectors in caneberries, including leafhoppers, whiteflies, and aphids. And this is just an illustration of some of the leafhoppers that we find in our traps. These are a leafhopper species called Graphocephala versuta that's a known pathogen vector in other, sim uh, in other systems, especially grape. So just to briefly touch on some of my other um, interests here, uh, to talk about some potential caneberry pests. The first one I want to briefly mention is the light brown apple moth. This is the region in California where this particular invasive pest is currently located at and is under quarantine for. The light brown apple moth is a leaf roller and it does pretty much the same thing as many other native leaf rollers that we have here. These are photos off of Mark Bolda's blog. I gave you all the link in the notes page and I encourage you to take a look at that. Mark Bolda is a farm advisor in Santa Cruz County, California, one of the areas where they grow a lot of their, their cane berries. And here's some potential damage that light brown apple moth can cause to cane berries. The actual um, feeding of the insect on the leaves is not as much of a concern, but they'll tunnel up and build these silken cases for themselves, and that can be a contamination issue, and this is what the larva looks like. I don't anticipate that light brown apple moth is going to be a game changer in terms of management for us, but it is a quarantine pest, and that can raise issues for export and import from areas. So that's its primary role as, as as an issue in terms of being an invasive pest, but it has yet to have spread widely beyond California. There are active trapping programs in the southeast, and if this is something you're concerned about, definitely talk with cooperative extension agents in your area. The next insect, which may potentially be more important than light brown apple moth, is the spotted wing drosophila. This is a male spotted wing drosophila. You can see right there how it gets its names. It has two spots, one on each wing. This is a female spotted wing drosophila, and this is a close-up of what makes them interesting in terms of pest management. She has a serrated knife-like ovipositor egg-laying device that she uses to infest sound fruit. This is what makes this particular fly so different from other drosophila species, which we're primarily familiar with as being the little flies that get on our bananas if we let them get overripe in our house. These guys like sound fruit out in the field, and this is a larva feeding in a cherry. What's particularly troubling about them is that they've spread rapidly since their initial detection in 2008 in some backyard cherries in California up and down the west coast. So they're now found at many locations in California, many locations in Oregon, some spots in Washington, and they've been detected in Florida. So that spread itself has been pretty rapid. That being said, they don't like cold weather that much. So I'm really interested to see what's going to happen after this winter. I anticipate that if we have decent overwintering populations in California, which we do, that that spread is just as likely to occur again, even if the harsh winter conditions in Florida and on the East Coast have knocked down those populations there. 
As I mentioned, the larvae feed on sound, soft skin fruit. They're probably not going to be an issue for citrus production. It's just too thick for them to get through. But for things like cane berries, they're particularly problematic. Mark Bolda, again in California, has some really nice posts on this particular insect. So if you want more details on management tools that they're working out, that's an excellent resource to check out. They have a very short generation time. That means they can have lots and lots of generations in a ripening cane berry plot. Females lay lots of eggs. And I mentioned um, there's a high mortality at freezing temperatures, so it's possible that this winter was a little hard on them, particularly on those East Coast populations, which would be encouraging. I have on here that the males are sterile at greater than 86 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't want that to be too comforting to folks because folks in the Southeast see that and we think, okay, well, we're not going to have to worry about them as much, but there's pretty much somewhere during the summer where the insects could hide out and find temperatures that are below 86 degrees, even on really hot days. So I don't know if that's necessarily going to be a, a game breaker. Again, I mentioned Mark Bolda's blog is an excellent resource for information on this particular pest. We're developing an early detection monitoring network in the Mid-South, specifically in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. We're going, to be, we're going to begin training people in March, and there's a lot more info on that on my blog. Finally, I'll just talk a little bit about stink bugs. The stink bug work has been done by Don, uh, Doug Pfeiffer and Laura Maxey at, a univer at Virginia Tech. And there's a number of different species of stink bugs that can be present in cane berries, particularly in the southeast. The fruit damage that they're causing, however, is unclear. There's no threshold or scouting procedures for them, and only broad-spectrum insecticides are registered and therefore recommended. What Laura's been working on is actually looking at the feeding behavior of stink bugs and seeing what type of damage they might actually be causing. What she's observed them doing is feeding on veins of leaves, sepals on developing fruit, and then this is some of the injury associated with stink bugs she's been seeing on fruit. She's been seeing this type of injury to individual droplets, and this is actually due to feeding by the bug between the droplets, not on the individual droplets themselves. And I'll mention that again as we flip through to the video at the very end. This is the other type of damage we're concerned about. Stink bugs are a pot potential contamination uh, nuisance as well. As we all know, they're named stink bugs for a reason, and you can actually smell and taste when stink bugs release their odorous compounds on and around cane berries. So they're a contamination concern because of that. This is the video I mentioned. Um, this is saved as a file that you can download in the file sharing section. I encourage all of you to do it. Do that. What it, what it actually shows is the stylet of this green stink bug here going between the droplets and feeding. So unlike what we thought just thinking beforehand, before Laura did this work, we were assuming that the stink bugs were probably feeding on these individual droplets and potentially causing them to be leaky, causing them to turn white, causing damage to them, but that hasn't been what they've observed. What they've observed is actually feeding between them that may damage the droplets surrounding that feeding puncture because of damage to the, the receptacle underneath, but not necessarily individual droplet feeding. And I think that's my last slide. So with that, I'll encourage you all to download that file from, um, from the file sharing section. And I'm sorry we couldn't play it for you. And I'll take any questions that you have. I'm going to move us into that file sharing so that people can um, download this one. It's the greens by yellow rasp um, right there. That's the file that you can upload. And I will also post both. PDF of both uh, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Barak's um, presentations right now so that you can get them before the end. I do hope um, that folks, if you've got questions for uh, Dr. Barak or doc Dr. Johnson, please, um, now's your chance. Do we have any um, questions? Anybody? Uh, they're trying to soak it all in, I'm sure. That was a lot of great information. And I also want to um, comment that it really is, uh, it's really interesting for me as an extension person to watch uh, in other areas where some of these pests, the different pest problems 
because uh, it's been alarming to me. I've, I've worked in extension for uh, 20 years or so, and just the change in the diseases and insects that we see that we thought we would not see in our area, we are seeing now, and it, this is a nice opportunity for us to get a little heads up about what might be coming our, our way. Um, no questions for Dr. Barak or Dr. Johnson? Anybody? Well, I think they're, I think we've totally wowed them. <laughs> thank you guys very much. Um, I also <laughs> want to thank all of you for joining us for all these Barry webinar series. Um, I really am indebted to uh, my colleagues, um, Kathy Heidenreich, for all of the um, PR work she helped me with, for all of the extension hosts, Jeff Miller, Colleen Cavanaugh, Sharon Bachman, Sue Wise, uh, for hosting live sessions, and Dr. Marvin Pritz for his guidance on this. And I also um, want to thank all of our speakers. We had some excellent, excellent speakers, and I'm looking forward to having those archives available to everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson and Dr. Barak. And please, all of you registrants, be looking for a survey that will be coming in the next couple of weeks. This is very important for the, our final um, analysis for the program, and uh, this will help us with future webinar series. And we want all of your comments, uh, constructive criticism, and otherwise, please don't hesitate to share that. And thank you all very, very much. I will post Don's presentation right now. And um, again, thanks a lot. And you all have my contact info both from my presentation and um, from my webpage. And feel free to, uh, to get in touch. I put that there for a reason.